Hello, welcome to Carrot and Blue. My name's Dan Rowlett. I'm joined once again by John Townley at Hockey Social Club, the venue for our live event on June the 1st, which we've sold 250 tickets to, by Ooh, the way. Scary. 250 people in here. That, that's a, quite a wild thought, isn't it? We'll be up on stage, which you can't see behind the camera. Imagine like, sitting out here and talking about the end of the season. Well, probably more than 250 as well. By the time this goes out, promote possibly, it. possibly yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you want tickets, there's a link in the description. They are free. Come and see us. We'll talk about the end of the season. We'll do a QA and a as well. Thanks to Hockey Social for letting us film here this afternoon and host our live event. Today's topic, and this is probably something we'll talk about at the end of the season with Matt and the guys as well. detail, yeah. Player of the season. Now, there's probably three or four candidates for this, maybe, and, and a couple of honourable mentions as well that I can think of off the top of my head. Now, I don't think we've not necessarily got to pick our player of the season today obviously there's still two more games not that that's going to make a massive difference to the conversation again as we as we record this we haven't played Liverpool yet and obviously Brighton on the final day so let's nominate our, our picks then at least I'll go first John McGinn somebody who and I've spoken about this a few times on the podcast I probably would have expected him not to be here next season when Gerard was the manager I just thought he's going nowhere he's probably not going to be good enough to make the, the step up to the top six and that's where we want to be he struggled as captain. Yes, he's great internationally for Scotland, but it's a different level. At the top, you know, the higher end of the Premier League, he won't be here. Fast forward, what, five, six months? And I'm talking about him as player of the season. And I don't think he would be my pick, but he's certainly in the conversation, isn't he? Yeah, and I think everything you say there, Dan, is because of... And he said it himself, McGinn. He said, I think, something along the lines of... I'd have to be Wan McGinn to kind of stay to stay in the team. Um, and what he means by that is that he needs to be... Sexy. Yeah, or something that he hasn't been allowed to be, is what I'd say. It sounds simple, but we all know that his role under Steven Gerrard was <laughs> a whole lot different to what he's playing under Unai Emery, which is something more similar to how he plays for Scotland. And whenever there's an international break, you expect him to score a handful of goals. And if he continues, he could be nearing that record for a player that's... <laughs> a midfielder then yeah he's sort of racking them up for them and he doesn't do that too often for Villa he has I don't think he's scored many goals over the last 18 months but in terms of how he can affect the game and push it into those positions from sort of those swashbuckling runs that he'll do or the way he can pin a defender get us out of troubled situations and Using set press yeah all of that he can we all know he can do it but to the effect that he does it, he needs to be in the right position, being given the, the license to do certain things. And that's what Emery has given him. We know that Emery spoke to him when he first came in and said, what's your best position? And by the way, you know, Emery knows that, but he wants to get it from John McGinn of where are you most confident? Where do you think you can better affect the game through your unique skill set, which not many players in the Premier League have, if any. You know, I always say, it, imagine playing against John McGinn. If you're a Premier League midfielder, it must be a nightmare because you don't know what he's going to do, where he's going to turn, and how do you stop it <laughs> when he's running past you? I think if you were describing John McGinn's game, I mean, not that he's going to be this type of major club, well, he could be, this major club legend. If you're telling your grandkids about John McGinn in, in 30, 40 years' time, and you were describing the way he kind of held players off and bullied his way through midfield and carried the ball, you, you kind of imagine him as this kind of like six foot three Yaya Torre type who's going to barge yeah. around and body people. Yeah. I don't know how tall he is, 5'9", five, 5'10", five, something like that. He's not this massive, bulky, stocky bloke. He's quite true, actually, this year. He, looks, he probably looks fitter than ever. But the description of the way he plays the game probably doesn't suit how he physically looks, which is maybe almost like part of the enigma. You kind of think, how's he doing that with his, like, his windmill arms and his butt back into people? It, it, what he does is, is very unique. Yeah, that's and, the right word for it. And now that he's playing in an Emery team, again, you have to be at a certain level in terms of your technical ability but also how you can how you can process information as well I think that's crucial because again we know that Emery sits his players down and does hours on debriefs um, you know watching training videos back as well so, you know, stuff like that really uh, detailed information you wouldn't have thought maybe a John McGinn player would want to do that he'd be on and be on the training pitch and, and, and doing it there practically but he's clearly taking all of that on and he's the club captain as well people forget that when he was first appointed there was almost a bit of a well why isn't it Mings and that, that conversation still exists and that's fine but I think for McGinn to sort of not come back from it but to prove why he can step up to the plate as well that's almost lost in a way I think if I don't know he was appointed club captain because Mings or whoever else was the captain before left or whatever it may be, everyone was saying, oh, yeah, Ming, you know, Miggin, we'll see what he can do. And it, it was almost lost that actually McGinn's done really well, I think, in that role. He's, he's been that leader that we need and we've got them across the team. But he's stepped up a lot under Emery. But he just needed that sort of push to 
you know, we believe in you and you can play in this role and we can get the most out of you that way. And he's proven how effective he can be again, which is great to see. Um, and that's why, yeah, he, he should be in the shout um, player of the season. I think because of his form, and again, as we've said, it wasn't really his fault, but because of his first third of the season, I suppose you'd say, maybe that would sort of work against him. But I look at the season as Emery onwards because I don't think many of the players could be blamed for what, we were doing under Gerard because there was clearly no real plan. And if the plan was to use McGinn covering the right back, then well, what, what's he supposed to do with waste. that? Yeah, exactly that. So if he's following Gerard's plans, then fair enough. But <laughs> you're not, that's not going to be the John McGinn that we all know and love. So, And probably a, another player on this list that, again, I'll, I'll nominate. I mean, we've come up with these together. It's not like I'm kind of, oh, this is my pick. Ollie Watkins, we can probably say similar yeah. things about what you just said there about it's not a full season. So... Can Ollie Watkins be Villa's player of the season? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, he had that great hot streak of scoring goals with 9 and 11, I think it was. 9 and 11, uh, yeah. At one stage. Player of 2023, if that was if that was the award, possibly. He's had, he's had a great second half. I know he's not scored for the last few games, but I mean, his goals per game in 2023 must still be very good. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if you've got the numbers, but 11 in... 15 or 16 or something yeah. is, is probably a, is still a great return but can he be player of the season probably not because he, he'd only scored three goals up until you know the end of January so we all wanted more from him and we've got that now yeah it's just whether I, I don't think I can I could I could I don't think I could crown him player of the season but worthy of discussion worthy, at least. exactly that worthy of discussion and everything he does for the team is so crucial in terms of how he sets the press what he's been asked to do and Emery as well um, which is a bit of a a difference in terms of not sort of don't even spend all your energy and stay between much. the goals yeah. yeah stay between the posts stay between the posts um, you know he's been doing less off the ball runs he's been involved in the build up much less so I think when he doesn't score I think some fans might think oh well Watkins was a bit quiet today you know he hasn't scored for a while but actually it's it's about his service can we give him chances and I'm you know, more than not, he will. He will take him. I know there's a few chances that he might miss, but I think every striker does that's that. Just, yeah, that's a striker, isn't it? You know, everyone goes and like Harland scored an absolute <laughs> barrel load of goals. But I can think of four or five times when Harland's missed a few, sort of not for him anyway, sitters. So it, yeah. you can't score a goal every game, but for what Watkins brings to the team, that's irreplaceable and invaluable. So for me, it's always about how can you partner him and how can you work around him rather than, oh, well, can we, you know, add an addition up front and take Watkins out of you know out of the team if he's not scoring goals it's like no you, you need to see what he can do um, with his teammates and how he can affect the game that way he's got the fourth most uh, shots on target in the Premier League this season as well which I thought was that's interesting which is in- yeah interesting because under Steve Gerrard in that first third of the season he looked so isolated and I don't remember a run of games where he could have any sort of service and he was quiet in those games because he was getting none none of the ball and again he was being that sort of tireless front man as as he has been for for years since he joined us but under Emery only now is he starting to kind of get the rewards for his work Um, and again we know he's working less but at the same time he plays a key role in terms of um, off the ball and out of possession he still you know again sets presses and yeah is um, a key player for us but possibly not player of the season because Mm. I think as the two we'll mention now are probably the main two candidates I'd, I'd say yeah probably so we'll talk about them in one go because they probably are not that we, they, you can say the same things about both but they probably are if I was picking and I, I, like I said I'm not going to make us pick today because this is a, a topic for the end of season show for yeah. sure this, it'd be between these two for me so Tara Mings and Douglas Louise both vastly important for, to the to Emery's side in, in two different key parts of the, p- the pitch whatever people think of Tara Mings we're noticeably worse without him so for me, that tells me how important he is as a, as a very very basic way of yeah. looking at it. And Douglas Dewey is probably somebody that, again, we've talked about maybe doesn't quite get the credit he deserves or, or maybe written off by some, some elements of the fan base in previous years where he's playing a, you know, a single holding midfield role, which isn't really his game. And Stephen Gerrard almost like forced him to be a, a number eight, which he's better going for, but that's not quite, quite his game either. It's almost a kind of hybrid role of, of both in a way. Yeah, talk to me about Louise first of all. I think the key for Louise is that, again, like John McGinn, He's settled on a on a role now that does suit his game more than anything else. He's he's almost learnt how to play a number six role or to the best of his ability under Dean Smith, Stephen Gerrard, and that has arguably now helped him into what he does now. Because if he didn't have that sort of tutelage in the Premier League, then although that wasn't his his you know, most preferred role, if he didn't have that sort of years of experience there, then he wouldn't. 
I don't think be as effective as what he is now in that double pivot that he plays with um, yeah. usually Bubakar Kamara John McGinn sometimes but it's just how we can progress the ball I think is what's key so for Villa players anyway this season he's got the most key passes at 41 the most passes into the final third at 115 throughout the season most progressive passes at 140 and the most shot creating actions is shot creating actions as well so for a player that sits relatively deeper compared to a John McGinn Jacob Ramsey yeah. uh, Buendia Ollie Watkins the influence that he's having on the team from a again a progressive point of view an attacking point of view and again in possession if you took him out <laughs> there'd be a noticeable difference about how we'd then be struggling to get the ball into the final third into the um yeah into the forward players and obviously we know what happens from there then then you're going to create more chances score more goals so that has been the sort of key for Louise this season for me especially under Emery you know how how can he move the ball from defence to attack and he's he's the kind of key to get it behind that and a, and a big role in that kind of you know, we spoke to John McKenzie on, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago now a couple of months ago about the that pivot player coming in to help play out from the back Douglas Louise is, is a key part to that in those little triangles with the full back and, and the centre half Louise will keep things ticking along and you know, we said it after the Spurs show that Spurs kind of dillying around at the back trying to do what, what Villa have done very well and kind of have to go long and Villa win possession back. Villa go up the pitch like that and Douglas Louise is key to kind of yes, turning yeah. his head and making yeah. things happen. And, and there has been a few times that you look at Brighton where there's a mix with Martinez, the Tottenham yeah, game, there was a mix as well. But you're that's like get that. a striker missing chances, those exactly. things will happen. Yeah, and for the, for the, I don't know, he might do 40 of those correctly in terms of playing out from the back and receiving the ball and turning. And there might be one in the middle of that that doesn't work. And that's over the course of the last... Yeah, however many games we had under Emery, 22, 23 Premier League games, that will be coached out, not coached out of him, but that those mistakes will become more um, infrequent, more regular, uh, you know, as he goes on. Um, he's also got more tackles and inceptions combined than any other player in the Villa team, and that might seem like a, well, he's playing in the position to do that, you know, make those <laughs> um, numbers, I suppose. But again, that just proves about how important he is to almost all elements of what we're trying to do and he's playing in, yeah. in the hub of the team as well and he does it with a bit of flair as, you know there was a nice flick that he did against Tottenham and we can rely on him to take the ball turn mm. it and as you say move into the final third but at the same time he wins it back you know, he gets involved so again there was that conversation where he was with Kamara and you thought well Kamara's making Louise look even better because Kamara's the new addition to the team well actually now that he's been out of the team you look at it and think well we all knew that Louise was a quality player before but now Emery has really taken his game on another yeah. level and he's still a really good age and you wonder in a couple of years how far could he go then mm. you know you look at someone like a Bruno Gimaraes who's playing really well for Newcastle I'm not saying he's that level yet Douglas Louise but I think he can get to something near that eventually I think he's that good also uh, almost an underrated ar- uh, weapon in his arsenal is set pieces now yeah, scored, yeah, scored a yeah, direct yeah. free kick against Spurs scored directly from a corner a couple of times this season like that's no fluke uh, so clearly like like you say, almost does the, I don't want to call it all the dirty work, but does the dirty work do inside, side, yeah. also very technical uh, yes. and great on the ball as well. So yeah. it, It's almost like a mix of his sort of background of being at Vasco to Man City, mm, and then he's yeah. been asked to do a bit of a ratty job, sort of with Smith and <laughs> a Gerard. A ratty job, did you Rat- say? Yeah, you, you know what I mean, like <laughs> yeah. getting around, being that number yeah. six, covering lines, that, that sort of thing. And it's all sort of come together now, and it's working, re- re- working really well um, for what Emery's asking of him at the moment. Let's talk about Tara Mings then. I, I love Mings. I could talk about him all day. I'm surprised yet that since we've kind of stepped up our, our podcast over the last I don't know, six weeks or so when we're doing 20 minutes about Ollie Watkins having a new contract or we did 20, 25 minutes about Douglas Weeze a few a couple of months ago and we're here we are talking about him again. I'm surprised we've not done a why Toro Mings is brilliant at football kind of episode as well, a, de- a show dedicated, dedicated to him, to that, yeah. which maybe is one for, for another time. I've said before, and I said I think the last time we were here, he, along with John McGinn now, exam- exemplifies the difference between Gerard and, and Emery, that out the team, loses the captaincy, kind of doesn't sulk, is then called upon by Stephen Gerrard to come back in and play as well. I mean, we talk about like how bad we were under Gerrard, I still thought, again, this will be key, um, true for other players as well, that Mings played well in, in some of those games under, under Gerrard as well, uh, as much as it was a kind of calamity 10 games or so and Mings had his moments Emery comes in and, and asks him to play a totally different style of football that maybe some fans wouldn't expect him to do is, is he that great on the ball is he great with his feet but we've seen him in seasons gone past ping them long diagonal so it's not like again that he's like a technically poor footballer he's got something in him 
But again, that's still very different to having to play out from the back and have under pressure. But again, how many times have we seen him kind of like cross turn somebody on the, on the bar line, like trying to get out of pressure himself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we go, if he loses that, that's a massive error. But if he doesn't and he gets away with it, it that's, that's contributing to building from the back. So yeah. almost in a strange way, he fits Emery's style of play perfectly, which probably is unexpected for, for some fans that think, well, if Emery wants to play out from the back, Torrings will be the first to go. That's not the case anymore. I think he's pivotal at the back. And again, if I was picking, I, I, it's very difficult to toss up between Mings and Luis. I, mean, I, I don't know whether my bias towards Ming, Mings would, would get him the, the shout for player of the season. But again, definitely in the conversation. Absolutely. I think it is a flip of, flip of the coin between the two because of their... Um, respective seasons Mings you're right I think when Emery came in it was a case of well and he would have known at the time this is a chance to prove myself to yeah. an elite manager and he I know he mentioned about how now I know what it takes to be an elite centre back and that was lost on some people who thought he said that <laughs> he is an elite centre back and it's like no he he knows how to get there and how to learn off one of the best managers in Europe um, and he's doing that he's got 85% pass accuracy um, this season I would have said his numbers would be inflated by the way Emery plays, but at the same time, he's still got to do it and he's still got to work under pressure because those passes that he's playing, they're not, you know, five-year passes all the time, as you say. They mostly are progressive and switching the ball to and, you know, right to left. He's also had um, the seventh most progressive carrying distance across all all Premier League players, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, so... Sorry, sorry. really? Yeah, <laughs> so that is proof of how or what Emery is asking him to do with the ball in terms of bringing it out from the back. So, uh, so yeah. to explain that for maybe myself and anyone else, progressive as in him carrying the ball out and, and dribbling with it to an extent, mm-hmm. Tyra Mings is seventh, seventh in the most in the entire Premier League. Yep. Really? According to the stats, yeah. Where's the stats from? FB Ref. Okay, <laughs> really well, good website. Blame them if you don't believe that. <laughs> yeah. So all like the dribblers and stuff where people carry the ball, it's more like Jacob Ramsey, you might say, in the Villa team, maybe he carries the ball the most, or John McGinn. Tyra Mings carries the ball the most. <laughs> Seventh most, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm stunned by that. <laughs> there you go. This but is the maybe he's my player of the season. This is all. this is the proof of um, Emery's Emery's work so far, and I think Conser deserves a mention in terms of how he's adapted to it as well. He, he rarely puts a pass wrong. Genuinely, after most games, you'll look at the numbers and you'll see he's done one, maybe two passes wrong out of about sixty, and that's um, nothing to be sniffed at. Cause again. Some fans might be thinking, oh, well, you know, you're playing out from the back. There's always going to be an option to play to. But you've got to realise you've got to be in the right, you know, you've got to adopt the right body position to play to the right and the left and players are coming on to you, applying pressure. It's there's The caveat between playing out the back is that the opposition will then just press you more. So it, we all know it's a risky um, strategy, but the more we're doing it, the more successful we are um, of playing that way. Teams are going to be all of a sudden more reluctant to do it because they think, well, Villa are going to get out of this quite easily. So... That again has worked into a worked into our favour a lot going into next season too. But yeah, Mings has been colossal for us. He, again, we know how good he is, but again, to do it under someone like Emery, it just it brings his game on tenfold. And like most of the players in the squad, he's benefited from his appointment. And you're right, there was a point where it was well, Mings is either going to be, you know, not capable of doing this, or he is going to be capable. It, 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 there's no sort of in between. You, you know, you're either good enough or you're not, and he's proven, like most of the players, that they absolutely are. So, yeah, full credit to him for how he's adapted. Just very quickly, honourable mentions, and again, these aren't players that I would consider to be player of the season, but Emi Martinez kept a lot of clean sheets again and, and been very good. Ashley Young done a, a sustained job now in the side at his age. Again, you'd have thought, and I've, I've said a few times on the show, that if he's playing a long distance of, of the of the league, you kind of think, well, maybe the recruitment's not the best, but he's come in and been brilliant on, on several occasions. And again, like his age is almost the defining factor. You think if he was 25, you go, oh yeah, he's a good player and he's doing a good job. But to do it at that age at this level, unbelievable. Alex Moreno, again, not a player of the season because he's only had half the season. But again, the impact, we've talked about it before. If you've not seen it, we did a video specifically about him. The impact he's had on the way we've been able to play almost elevates his kind of individual abilities to be like what he means for Emery and the team. That's why he'd be considered as a player of the season. But again, played half a season, so it wouldn't be fair. Um, any other one number mentions? I mean, I think you can go through the team and say that well, here's how X player has improved. Probably, yeah. But uh, yeah, Conte would be the other one. I think again, he's I've said it before, I think he's one of the most indirect players in the league because he uh, th- there aren't many flaws in his game. And when Villa win and keep clean sheets, he's never really mentioned as a you know what would be a man of the match or whatever it may be. Possibly cause he's playing alongside. Um, Mings, who would again have been equally as good too. But yeah, he deserves 
you know more credit than what he gets. I think not yeah. necessarily just from Villa fans because Villa fans know it, but from from the outside world, I suppose. But that could probably be the case for Villa as a whole. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 Martinez, we know, is that good. So. But concert for me is yeah, and so I, him that, actually. That was almost a little bit Roy Keane for you there. Like, well, that's his job. Like, we know, Martinez can't be player of the season. I know, we know he's that though. good. Yeah, well, but those are the standards you set. Unfortunately yeah. for Martinez, you you kind of if you dip below them, it's a bad season, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Young and concert for me would be the two honourable mentions either side of that. So if I, if I had to push you now for an answer on one of those fours player of the season, who would you go for? Um. I, you're not going to get an answer out of me yet, Dan. You'll have to wait till the live show. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about player of the season and goal of the season, at most underrated player, and kind of like the player awards at the live show. That We'll kind of hand those out to the players, not physically. <laughs> I, 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 doubt, I doubt they'll be coming, but if they are, that would be great. To. If you want to come, instead, there's tickets down below, like I mentioned, they are free. Hockey Social Club, this entire venue holds, I think, 550 people. We've already sold sold I say they are free 250 so half this room is full already as we record this on the 15th of May um, so whenever this video comes out we'll have sold more because we're selling them every single day so if you want to book your place the tickets uh, the link to the tickets is in the description below get them quick because there's every chance they will be gone going on hotcakes that, yeah. which would be mad um, but thank you very much for, for watching our content as always and watching this video specifically leave your comments below with who you think is player of the season and we'll assess those and that might be will impact our discussion at the live event because somebody might say oh, what about so and so and I'll go oh yeah, yeah. I'll nick their answer yeah, for, wrong, for, yeah, the, yeah. for the podcast um, so get involved thank you very much for watching thanks for John for joining me and we'll see you again very soon funky music time thank you for listening to Claret and Blue and Aston Villa podcast if you enjoyed today's episode then please do let us know we love hearing your thoughts and comments we'll be back soon with another episode but until then up the villa up the villa